So we're very honored to have with us tonight Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz as our first speaker. Roxanne grew up in rural Oklahoma, the daughter of a tenant farmer and a half Indian mother. Her historical memoir, Red Dirt, Growing Up Oki, tells the story. She completed her doctorate in history at UCLA, specializing in the colonization of the Western Hemisphere and Indigenous Nations histories. Roxanne is Professor Emerita at California State University, East Bay, where she co-founded the Department of Ethnic Studies. There's all this high-tech stuff here, so I don't, <laughs> if I touch something, I'm not supposed to. Uh, <laughs> you may hear funny sounds. I'm going to, I'm going to set on my timer just so that I keep track. Okay, well, I'm so happy to be here tonight. What a, what a great. Uh, group of people we have gathered here, many uh, young people, glad to see a couple of children with them. Um, being in the Native movement so long, uh, when I go to meetings and there are no children, it seems so weird, you know, because generally, you know, the whole family comes to um, Native gatherings, so I, I like to see all the generations here, and I think that's happened tonight, good to be here. And I think so much, I think Red Spark and the organizers, I've seen them working here, the nuts and bolts. It takes a lot to organize an event like this. So I really honor them and thank them for including me um, it, as part of, of the celebration of uh, International Women's Day. Um, I too had no knowledge of International Women's Day. The fact is very few uh, North Americans had knew anything, even though it started, you know, in the United States uh, with uh, um, women workers. It was not something ever in the history books or told to us. So we actually, when we started um, the women's liberation movement in 1967, 68, um, it. It wasn't right away even, but the communists, at least, people in the Communist Party, and some of those women were in this women's movement, they knew this history because they knew it through their history, you know, the Communist Party. And, um, and these, so many of these, uh, you know, the workers were um, organized by the communists. So we, we learned about it. Um, at first, I know the first conference that um, I helped organize was in Boston in 1969. And I remember I didn't know about March 8th. I hadn't yet really sunk in. Maybe I knew about it, but I thought it was not relevant to you know the culture. Um, was um, uh, We had it on Mother's Day. That was really the only, say, appropriate day to have it. By the next year, uh, organized a conference and, and we did it on March 8th. And so that happened very quickly. I think it's a good example of how you can rescue history, you know, inspiring history, that it really is cut off from us, whether it's, in, I think more than any other people, and it's not complete, as we heard Carolyn uh, explain, that. Uh, there's a, a historical memory. There's a historical memory of, of boarding schools. That's that's a part of the colonialism. But there's also a historical memory um, of uh, of resistance, and and in some places more than others, we have, I think, in the United States, the Lakota people um, have um, maybe the strongest. Um, surviving very specific cultural memory of uh, the crazy horse sitting bull era the heroic uh, resistance that that came down to us and then we start looking and all other all people 
all oppressed people resist. There's no such thing as not resisting, because they do resist, and you have to find it, you know, what is it, and bring it back alive, bring it to be a part of the oral history, but also to um, teach it, you know, get it taught in the schools, insist that it be taught to all the children, not just you know, the indigenous children, or if it's a working class history, um, to workers, but everyone needs to know that history. Um, so the People's History Movement um, began, you know, Howard's Den, uh, it began before um, in a more radical way, and some of it began um, right here in Vancouver, by a gentleman sitting in front of me here, Ray Bob, and uh, Lee Bob is now the miracle. And I had the great good fortune of being in a, uh, our AIM Council, American Indian Movement Council in San Francisco. We had, uh, we were also a Marxist group, and most of us, I think, you know, really all of us were. Um, and we connected up in 1975 with the Native Study Group in Vancouver. And they were doing, um, I don't know if, no one seems to, that I've talked to here remembers Bobby Lee, the life history of, uh, of Lee, uh, Bob, Lee Miracle. And uh, that kind of, we had to revive that kind of history, life history. But it's the heroic history of someone's life, but it also tells the story of a period of people, and I'd like to see that particular book revived, you know, put back into print and got to be a bestseller, because I reread it not too long ago, and it is still an amazing uh, document, and a model for how we can write this history. So I think International Women's Day is um, what, what we need to do now. The, the UN has declared it, March 8th is a UN uh, day for women all over the world. The, the month of March is in many, many countries, in the United States and Canada. And um, there have been international women's years and decades. In uh, the decade for women, the first one in the UN started in 1973. 83 and conference, UN conferences. So very quickly that movement within five years of its founding had become global and international. And because of the way you, the UN operates with um, Africa being um, the largest block of, of countries in the UN, International Women's Day got really deeply rooted in, you know, in the work and the organizing in Africa less so in the Western Hemisphere and Asia. I think after Beijing in 1995, a lot more, but I think linking up with the global and the political struggles all over the world and solidarity is something that uh, International Women's Day has, has uh, inspired. And it strengthens everyone, you know, to have but we need the radical edge of it. We need to, it to be brought back, um, <clears throat> not as a, you know, a glass ceiling. Uh, I don't even like the term gender equality because basically, okay, we live in this patriarchal world that, you know, capitalism and imperialism has, and settler colonialism has formed. Equality is like we want to be a part of that, you know. So I think what we really want is, is um, you know, for that other half, males, it is what, it, that's not what represents either, you know, the, um, um, the idea of equality in the societies that we now live in. I think we have to, have to demand that. I mean, I think reforms that we have to be there, we have the right to be there, but to change it and not to, you know, just be a, a, another uh, piece of the puzzle that just strengthens. Uh, and that's the way, you know, the women's movement, women's liberation movement has been used by capitalism, as Martha pointed out, uh, not only um, through imperialism to rescue 
rescue of women in, in um, Afghanistan and um, Muslim countries in general and here and there, um, but also to um, tap women's uh, energy and you know the ambition because they've been locked out and it, it really uh, sucks you know has sucked the air out of the women's liberation the radical women's liberation movement and then a stereotype image of that period that five-year period of its formation it was a very radical initial formation um, some of you in here um, look to be my generation, and you, you remember the, that, that at least in the United States, um, was really founded by young women, uh, white and black mainly, who had worked in Mississippi organizing. And the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was an incredible revolutionary organization. And um, they were organizing plantation workers the semi-slavery that still existed in the South. People who are illiterate, illiterate, never gone to school. They were doing a voting registration of these people who, you know, they were locked out of voting because they couldn't read and write. It was a literacy test. And that's how Jim Crow operated at that level. So they learned to organize. And then when Black Power came along and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee um, told the non-African Americans in that uh, organization that they needed to go organize in their own communities. The women um, started talking about, well, what is my community? The, especially the young white women. What is my community? I don't want to go back to the suburbs of you know, Connecticut and, <laughs> and, and organize uh, there. I don't feel comfortable there. So there was this sense of, of, and I think it was brought up in SNCC, well, what about women? You know, so these, this were, and I was not in Mississippi. That wasn't my experience. I was actually, similarly, I guess, working with the African National Congress and really learning um, learning, you know, about liberation movements and how that, that could be applied. Um, and I guess, you know, was really bounced by that um, into uh, joining in with uh, starting a women's liberation movement. So it had revolutionary roots is what I'm saying that, and we should honor that and go back and excavate uh, that period of time and make that the tradition that we're celebrating. Not, you know, the glass ceiling stuff or Betty Friedan's uh, um, oppressed, wealthy housewife uh, in the suburbs. Um, that may be a cause, but that wasn't really, you know, that wasn't really the essence. And what's nice about the international, the UN um, uh, programs, is because of Africa and African liberation movements, because they were very, very new to the UN at that time. Um, the, there is that radical uh, element to what goes on internationally, much more than, um, and we need to bring some of that home and I think get involved more in the UN process at many levels. The indigenous peoples lobby at the United Nations that I've been working in since 1977 when we started the project, um, it was actually 1974 um, that uh, this has, it, it has, it has literally saved the lives of many, many people, especially in Latin America under the, under the uh, dictators and the military regimes in Brazil and um, Argentina and Chile. So, and it has helped strengthen our treaties. We now have a, <clears throat> a uh, UN uh, study of treaties, that's an official uh, document of the United Nations, including Canadian treaties, indigenous treaties, and um, the United States. And it is, you know, it's 
it's not easy to shame these uh, governments into obeying international law. Canada in the past has been more uh, sensitive to being in line with international law. Um, but um, what it does, most importantly, is for the people, whether it's women or indigenous peoples, um, migrant workers, there's also a you know, migrant workers treaty in the UN that very few people are, are using. Um, is it, it, gives a, it gives a sense of being an actor in the world. I remember, you know, in Franz Fanon's um, uh, Wretched of the Earth, he tells about the, uh, he was working on, you know, propaganda on, with the, with the uh, uh, revolution, and they would broadcast the people fighting out in, you know, out in the mountains, out in the Atlas Mountains. Um, they would get the radio messages about the UN resolution that went through. He said it was a, a matter of quitting being so beaten that they would quit, to going on, to continuing. So that's, an, that's very important, you know, when you're on the edge of survival, <laughs> that you have a spark. And that's what red spark is, right? <laughs> um, so I think that, that for indigenous peoples, it has been a, we have a special rapporteur on the rights of indigenous peoples. Um, the new one, I think, coming in is going to be a woman. It was the two previous ones have been men. Uh, Vicky Corbes, who's a colleague of Coma and uh, is a Filipina uh, indigenous person. So I think you know we have that to learn from also from the International Women's Day, how it was rescued brought back, but not with its roots, you know, in the working class movement, in class, where we bring class back into our analysis of everything. Class in the, in the sense of, um, what we used to call it Maoism, but, uh, you know, Samir Amin sense of, we have, you know, imperialism creates also dominant states, imperialist states, colonial powers, uh, settler colonialism, and so there's a relationship, they call it North-South, but indigenous people and other peoples within the North are also of the South. And, um, so we, bringing class back in, we can, we can figure out structurally and understand, you know, what, we're, what, what is happening and how we can strategically proceed where does um, women, you know, organizing a mass, reorganizing a mass women's movement that this time would be led by indigenous women in, you know, in the Americas um, and have a depth that uh, was not attainable, you know, with the, kind of, with the experience and knowledge we had uh, in 1967, 68. So I think, you know, we, we were talking today, I said I hadn't said this for a long time, and apparently you, you all say it all the time, and I didn't know it, but that for, we have a lot of problems with um, dysfunction and um, that comes with poverty and uh, with uh, trauma from past, uh, from past violence and memory of living with um, knowledge of intentional genocide in the past that could happen again any time. And um, the only real cure for that is you can do so much work on yourself, but is, is really being part of the revolutionary movement to make change. Well, thank you.